Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome. Uh, my name is Ahed Mubarak, I'm the uh, CEO and the VHR Matt host of this program, uh, along with uh, various others, uh, distinguished speakers. So we are uh, going to have this webinar on the, uh, the topic is sustainability. I request everyone to be on the mute. Uh, uh, Rida, please mute everyone uh, to avoid this problem. Right. So B and I, as I think uh, Kiong, uh, my friend was already mentioning this. Uh, factor uh, the, behind this, uh, this, this process is that the, the sustainable uh, development goals, you know, which is uh, also emphasizing the ESG framework. I would not like to go into the details about explaining the ESG. I think uh, this terminology is being used widespread uh, all around the uh, world. Uh, so in the context of the social, uh, which is, I would say, the pillar of the ESG, D&I uh, considered, is considered to be an important agenda for everyone, not only for the organizations which are interested in the uh, D&I, but also for the investors who consider it as, a, as an engine of revenue and the engine of the, you can say, value addition in the society uh, for the organization. So in that context, uh, this is becoming more and more important uh, obviously, the organizations who are on the learning trajectory, they are very much interested to progress and move forward. But there are, uh, uh, I think, uh, over there, the important thing is that uh, should the organization reinvent or uh, they should use the framework which has already been developed. So uh, the Center for Global Inclusion, I think that uh, has a special importance in terms of being a more than uh, around 30 years old organizations with a very rich history of uh, developing the D&I benchmarks. And the most recent version uh, that they published was 2021, uh, which uh, comprises of the uh, various, uh, at least uh, 15 categories and these frameworks, which are sensitive to the needs of the uh, post COVID situations and uh, also taking care of, of the other important aspects of the D&I. And uh, we are the pioneer the diversity hub or child matrix is pioneer in introducing the GDIB framework almost five years ago in Pakistan. So we help out the organization, at least uh, so far we have facilitated 42 organizations in using a global diversity inclusion benchmarks. We have their, um, uh, we have evaluated the systems and the processes and uh, all kinds of knowledge management. Uh, uh, you know, we are aware of uh, what they're, they're doing. So uh, just to promote the GDIB, this year we organized a uh, certification program around this, where uh, in, which in this program, I think almost 40 people from around the globe, at least eight countries, uh, they participated. And uh, in order to organize this program, uh, we gathered the galaxy of speakers, uh, who on one hand, these expert panelists uh, who were instrumental in developing the global uh, D&I benchmarks, at the same time, the practitioners in Pakistan, the C-suite executives who have the hands-on experience and expertise to use the global benchmarks in the organization settings. So we gathered them to share their knowledge and expertise and uh, they're trained. And uh, we uh, also organized an assessment process for the people who went through this program. Uh, uh, subsequently, I think this program, uh, uh, since it was closed, so there was an ongoing demand. So we uh, came up with a hybrid framework where uh, we could offer the recording and the presentation of this program. Also some opportunity for engagement like today's sessions where the people who are even now attending this program, around 20 people, uh, they could come in contact with the speakers, they share their viewpoints and also get to know what is happening around the world by sharing their own expertise as well. So in this process, almost 20 people that are attending this program and otherwise also we have a network of the organization uh, at the uh, at the organization level, at the individual level also, who are uh, you know very motivated and who are very keen to implement the global D and I benchmarks in their organizations. So today's session is one of those series of uh, facilitation, where the different people they come up with their experiences, they uh, pick up a different topic. Now this everything is taking place from uh, the HR metrics, which has expertise in some of the very unique areas. Uh, we have our 
analytics in our DNA because we, cre we created this company on the philosophy of uh, linking the uh, HR performance with the organization performance in measurable terms through the data analytics. Then we introduced the uh, SHRM certification in Pakistan uh, because as, as most of you would be aware that SHRM is the world largest HR association having presence in more than 165 countries and 300,000 plus members. DNI, as I mentioned already, and one of another uni, uh, unique product that we offer is our global HR standards. Uh, fortunately, over there also, we are the pioneer in introducing the global HR standards, uh, not only introducing, but developing the standards. When I so it formed a committee, and uh, only 11 countries were the pioneer countries, Pakistan was one of them. So, uh, with regards to the DNI, uh, we have a portfolio of services which includes uh, the uh, assessment and facilitation to the organization, then some recognition through the awards and the conferences so where the different practitioners, they come up, share their success stories. And we also publish those stories through a magazine, almost 13 editions have been published. And uh, then we uh, provide opportunity to, to the uh, practitioners to get in dialogue with each other. Today's session is one of those series. Women for Board is another inter intervention where we uh, provide a hand holding to the C-suite women, connect them with the uh, board directors so that they, are, they learn the, uh, the uh, tips for success. Uh, on Periodically, we conduct the benchmarks, uh, uh, the uh, surveys uh, leading to the benchmarks, uh, and then two other initiatives like the Veterans Initiative and the Equal Opportunity Advocacy Council. This, so this makes a portfolio of the services. Now, uh, without taking much of the time, I would like to now refer back to my colleague, uh, uh, Rida, who is going to introduce the speakers. Uh, I think an amazing galaxy of speakers comprising of the Nini Mulefi, Jamal Nasser, Marella Spegovic, Carrie Alric, and toward the end, uh, myself. So with this, uh, Rida, I hand you over the presenter rights and I request you to uh, introduce the speakers. But before that, uh, I think each one of us must be aware uh, that this program is almost for uh, almost 2.5 hours where all this every speaker is going to have uh, on an average 20 minutes talk time followed by 10 minutes question answer session so uh, that's all from my side i hope you enjoy the webinar and i uh, i'm once again thankful to each one of you for your presence i'm assuming more people are going to join we have i think i think around 100 registrations and i'm uh, grateful to the speakers who took the valuable time from their busy schedule and they are with us to share their knowledge and expertise with uh, all of us. Thanks a lot. And uh, Rida, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zahid. So today we have with us, as Zahid said, a panel of speakers. And uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Sayed Rida from HR Metrics. And a very warm welcome to Nini Malefi, who's our first speaker for, for today, who's the owner and CEO of Mandate Malefi, Malefi Consultant South Africa, a company that spans over 20 years in the field of transformation, diversity, equity, and inclusion, culture change, and leadership development. She will be speaking on the systemic approach to DEI with multiple impact on organization, Nini has conducted work in the social justice space and over the last 10 years, she has been working with the judiciary, the bar councils of South Africa, and has offered social context and diversity workshops for the nine high courts, the Supreme Court and the Constitutional Court of South Africa. Nini is an international speaker and has facilitated workshops and spoke at conferences in USA, Germany, Bangladesh, Malaysia, and countries on the topic of diversity and inclusion, racism, change, and values-driven leadership. Nini is the author of a book, which is A Journey of Diversity and Inclusion in South Africa, Guidelines for Leading Inclusively. She's also the co-author of the Global Diversity and Inclusion Benchmark Standards Around the World, and also a board member of the Center for Global Inclusion USA. Thank you and welcome, Nini. Thank you. Thank you so much, Saida and Zahid, for the invitation. Let me go straight into sharing my presentation with you today, which is adopting a systemic approach to DEI. Um, firstly, I just want to start by, and I'll be sharing really more a case study of the work that I'm doing, that systemic design you know, integrates systems thinking and human-centered design. 
with intention of helping organizations to deal with complexity. We all know that organizations are quite complex. Diversity itself is a mixture of similarities, differences, and complexities. Thus, you know, organizations need to design and apply inclusive systems and processes that deliver not only uh, DI results, but also business results. Um, so the ongoing narrative should always be, does diversity, equity, and inclusion, is it integral to the strategy of your organization? That's a very important question that we should be asking ourselves. Um, and when we look at this complex puzzle, um, you know, historically, we have had too much piecemeal work with separate projects that are never connected or integrated. When I look at a few years ago, when a company calls me to come and help with diversity and inclusion, um, they, would, they would say, come and run a workshop there, and then we did something there, we did something there. There isn't really that integrated approach. So this creates misalignment among systems elements. I'm sure you'll agree with me. The pieces of the complex puzzle always need to come together to complete the whole and function at the highest levels. Because in order for us to have impact through this work, we need to pull the strings together. That is what is happening within the entire system. So um, I think Zahid, in, in his introduction, of course, many people here would know the, the GDIB. Um, knowing that the reason I really like the GDIB is because if you look at these 15 categories, we are saying whenever you want to do work on DEI, it is all of the 15 categories of an organizational life. You know, looking at, if you look at category 10, this is where people often think that um, DEI work is just about learning and development, it's just about workshops. But what about the 14 other areas that we need to look at? So this is where we need to approach it in a holistic and a systemic um, way. So first of all, you know, if, if, if I look at the work that I do basically in South Africa, within the broader African continent and beyond, it's always important to, to say when we talk about diversity, we are not just talking gender and race. Every country, as we know, has its pain point. So I always like positioning that when we talk about diversity, this small little blob here, we often forget that we even are talking about diversity of personality, diversity of thought, even neurodiversity. Um, you know, um, Harvard Business Review had an article a few weeks ago to say neurodiversity is now becoming a competitive edge. That um, I'm sure parents who've got children here with autism spectrum disorder will agree that schools, even the world of work, has not really grappled the idea of the gift that you get from people who are neurodivergent. So the challenges that are now happening now is that we need to look at neurodiversity not as pathology, but as another way of how can we enrich the, the conversation on diversity. Just looking at diversity of thought itself, you know, there are about almost like five dimensions of cognitive diversity, in fact, more, those that are identified. There's diversity of perspectives, diversity of interpretations, uh, inductive and deductive reasoning. You know, when people reason, um, some people start, start reasoning from a broader point of view, coming in the middle, others start small and broadening there. There's nothing wrong or right. It's just a diversity of thought. Or heuristics, which is the shortcuts or the steps we take towards problem solving. Or causal and predictive models. We actually saw it here with the onset of a corona, the first wave here in South Africa, where there were different scientists who had different predictive models. They are not wrong. If you see it this way, somebody see it that way, it really depends on your thought processes. So we forget this. It's a very important aspect of diversity. And of course, diversity of personality, introvert versus extrovert. So we need to present this topic in its richness. And then this other bubble, which is the one we often talk about, age, sex, gender identity, race, uh, sexual orientation. And then I like saying that there's also that gray bubble, which is what we call the acquired dimensions of diversity. Um, no one was born married here. No one was born with a degree. We acquire these things as we go about our lives. And then the outer layer, which is diversity of lived experience. So you can see the rich tapestry 
of diversity when we're talking about this topic it is really broad and then over and above that we need to add equity and inclusion in it so the positioning is very important so that each and every employee in an organization can see themselves that when we're talking about a uh, DEI if I'm a single parent I must see myself there and um, if I'm somebody from LGBTQ community I must see themselves if I'm somebody who's not that highly educated it means all of them and um, so it's an important positioning that we need to put there. And as we know that if you look at all of this, every country has its pain points. Here in our country, the pain point in South Africa is race and then gender. You'll go somewhere else, the pain point will be religion. In a different country, the pain point will be ethnicism uh, because of the histories of those countries. So very important for us to position and explain what diversity means. And then what I often also do um, is is to say you cannot do this work without aligning the head, heart, and the hands. This is a very well known uh, a, a model, I think, with its origins from Greek philosophy. And um, that you know, if you look at the the head, that at the head level, this is what we call intellectual buy-in. And um, the what? What is it that needs to be done? That's where targets live. That's where strategies uh, 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 live. If you say you need to have more people of color, we need to have more women, uh, it's at the head level. I often joke and I say, in all the 23 years I've worked in this field, I've never seen a spreadsheet transform any organization. Yes, you can have all the targets that this is what we need to do, but you need to move from the head to the heart. And the heart is the emotional buy-in. Why am I even doing this? And the emotional buy-in then, that's where inclusion also lives. And then from there, you say the behavioral effort, which is the how, that's the implementation. So aligning the head, heart, and hands will actually take you far with regards to achieving uh, what we need to, to, to achieve in a DI strategy. So when I work with leaders, um, I want leaders who are leading the way. All the executives need to identify and name their personal why and uh, and develop a vision for di you'll see in the 15 categories of the gdib um one of the foundations we have we have the foundation categories one of the foundations is to develop the vision for di but i often say that rather than just say come together put together a vision we i sit with the leaders to say what is your personal why why are you doing it? If you don't do the personal why, you run the risk. Like um, after the, the, just to give an example, after the George Floyd uh, thing, a lot of leaders wrote statements of commitment, I mean, statements of support to Black Lives Matter, and then it ended there because they were really not interrogating their why. Why do you want to drive this journey? So it's important to assist them to travel this journey. And why is this why important? Let me show you. Uh, this sorry this this personal why that the personal why for leaders is important because of the common transformation journeys what have i seen in the work that i've done with organizations is that some leaders drive di work as a management fed like everybody's doing it let me also do it let's put together something call consultants let's do something it becomes a management fed if it's a management fed you haven't interrogated your why when things get tough you rush in you lose momentum you fizzle out because if something is not your own personal uh, drive you just do it because they are doing it it's very easy you rush in you lose momentum the second uh, uh, journey that we often seen is what we call burning platform people who are doing it because maybe we are no longer getting uh, clients they are saying that we don't have enough women uh, on our c-suite therefore they won't give us business or we don't have enough people of color or whatever so you are doing it because of a burning platform there is something that is niggling if you are doing it because of a burning platform it's okay but it's not that sustainable because sometimes you feel the heat and then you get stuck and go back. I've often seen people who say, yeah, I've tried it. We tried, but this thing doesn't work. And then you go back because you were driven by a burning, burning platform. You haven't really stepped back and say, what is it that is going to impact my organization? What we are hoping for is that leaders will enter this journey because of a rallying cry of those who can see the light and um, feel the heat when you see the light when you know that this journey is difficult anyway you will feel the heat 
press on and do it anyway even if you come through the hurdles because you are not doing it because somebody else is doing it you are doing it because you believe it is the right thing to do for your business so we are hoping more leaders will stand up there as a rallying cry yes gdib is there to guide you to say what are those benchmarks but the why of doing this i cannot overemphasize that so so i'm just sharing with you quickly my We've developed over the years what we call a 10-step journey, a systemic culture change model that has truly helped organizations um, to, 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 to become more inclusive. It's not easy, but um, I think it's a good, good uh, model to share with you. Firstly, when you enter a system, it's important to identify a leadership sponsor and custodians. I'm sure if I talk to people who are consultants on the platform here even those who are working within organizations sometimes you work you are partnering with an organization somewhere along the way you're wondering it's like it's your baby it's like who actually is spending sleepless nights with this you need an internal sponsor a leadership a senior person who will be spending sleepless nights to say who is sponsoring where does the buck stop with this journey and because when I talk about the head, heart and hands, because this journey would be challenging and will be difficult. So at the head level, there are four steps that um, I've, uh, we, we often use. Step one, you establish what we call change champions. There is no way you can do this journey being um, an, an HR manager with an OD manager, an external consultant only. It needs to be a collective effort. So for you to truly have a good impact, do you establish change champions, train them on this is what the journey is, this is how we're going to be traveling together. And then develop a communication strategy. Why in, in the communication strategy you are going to say along the way, as we are achieving, because you'll see my, my word uh, continuously is a journey. As we are achieving this, we need to be communicating back to the stakeholders. This is what we are achieving. This is why we are doing it. And coming back and forth to report to the stakeholders. And then our step three, we call it, um, that's where we do assessments. Often you need to say, what am I solving for? You cannot just start with a workshop. You have to say, have I done a dipstick? And there's different, I know there's different assessments that all of us uh, use either the Leadership 360, or we also use an organization-wide survey of DEI or some values alignment. There's different assessments that we use, but what's important is that you need to at least know that what is the status quo now? What am I solving for? Where are the red flags? And what are, do the red flags tell me? So that when you then after you've received your results from your surveys, then you get to your vision. And the GDIB also tells you uh, around why it's important to have a vision. But let me share with you one of our biggest successes that we got out of the way we did a vision. So it's put, we start firstly with the senior leadership to say, what is, let's develop a vision for DEI, for your organization. And let's say we do with the executive, the exco team, maybe like 12 of them or whatever number they are. And we say, we, we guide them through a process of developing a statement of commitment, a vision. But then we say to them often, let's call it 70% complete. It cannot be 100% complete because there's still the next level. The next level often is called the ops core. People call it the main core, different levels. But the next level of leadership below the executives. So the senior executives come up with a draft vision. We took them through the process. And then we go to the next level to say, OK, here's a draft vision by the uh, senior leadership. Let us look at it and add. And you panel bid and you add. And then after that, we say, also, you are not complete. Now we go to the change champions. Remember I told you in step one, we've got change champions. And often change champions are representative staff members who are representing either different business units or different departments where they also are co-creating this vision for themselves. So that is not just senior leadership so that says, boom, there's your vision. So we did with the executives and then the next level, and then we go to the chain champions. And then the chain champions also give their inputs. It becomes a, the buy-in is beautiful when you see it. And when people say, yes, uh, this is now our vision. And then 
step uh, five and six you can see these ones fall under the heart here one and four all of this are just the head remember you are talking visions you are putting something on paper you haven't implemented anything it's just at the head level and then when you get to step five and six this is the heart this is where we do hearts and minds and hearts and minds is how do we engage uh, with you this is where we say hold up the mirror some of the change that we have to go through as the senior leadership either the leadership team or executive committee whatever an organization would call them we take them through their hearts and minds a, a, a dialogue we talk about their their bias we talk about issues of discrimination remember we would have also customized based on what came out of step three because this is iterative and you have to take it from all aspects of the system so we already know what are some of the uh, red flags that came out of here so we customize the workshops to say this is what needs to be done in order for us to empower the leaders and then step six you're doing the same hearts and minds but for the rest of the organization you always i feel always have to start with the senior leadership so that they also confront their own issues of lack of change and then uh, after the heart let's go to the hands the hands now this is step seven eight and nine how does that manifest itself as the hands? Let me give you a practical example. We'll be busy with step six, okay? In a workshop, we, we're busy with a dialogue around psychological safety or around um, a bias or around any form of discrimination that is part of the hearts and minds. And then one of the participants would say, Nini, I can hear you, but I can tell you now, our sexual harassment policy um, is just exist on paper. Or somebody would say the performance management system discriminates against people of color or against women or pay gap analysis so someone will then talk to you about something that is most a system a policy a procedure that you cannot resolve in a workshop so what do you do then because this has to be interconnected so when you get from the participants comments like this that we have a problem with our performance management system you note that what is the problem with that every heart and mind workshop that you do have to have an output report because you then say here are some of the outstanding things so from here then you you say on workshop number one there was an issue with performance management system workshop number four there was an issue with the sexual harassment policy or promotions policy whatever policy issues and then who gets the report from these hearts and minds the reports that will highlight outstanding systems policy practices number one the change champions whoever is the chairperson of the change champions must get the output of the report because these are helping us as well and um, as partners and then the head of the department we often say when we do hearts and minds we do it with natural working teams if i'm doing the marketing department today tomorrow i'm doing the ops tomorrow i'm doing the finance department i don't want mixing because sometimes you deal with issues that are pain points within that particular business unit so it's better if it's natural working teams so you are then able to identify issues that are systemic that needs to be handled and then step eight is called monitoring and performance management uh, what do you mean by that is that yes you have reported that policy number one policy number three practice number four is problematic remember step two i said communication strategy every time you go back you tell people i attended a workshop in july somebody attended a workshop in september you owe it back to them that remember you raised an issue about performance management remember you raised an issue about sexual harassment this is how far we are this is what we are doing and proactively inform people before they come back to you to say whatever happened to the issues that are raised and then step nine we call it embedding the culture and sustaining the momentum what do i mean by that remember here we said you came up with a vision which gives a kind of culture that you want so in order for us to check whether we are living this vision we need to be identifying along the way are there any shifts are there any changes and how do you know that is that you actually ask people that as we go along the journey can we report the good stories as well i've realized throughout this many years that we often only report what's not going well so we're saying via the communication strategy and 
the chain champions. We send people out to say, approach people at random who've been through this journey. What are you implementing? What is working? What is shifting? And you actually document the shifts so that when you go back and communicate, people are able to see that this journey does indeed work. And then the, and I know I'm summarizing, sorry, a long process, but, um, and then when we get to step 10, which is what we call post intervention assessment, this is where you repeat what you did here. Now let's say, because some clients have 30,000 people, others have 5,000 people, you know, the duration of this 10 step will differ as per the number of employees. But let's say from step one to step nine, because of the size of the organization, you took nine months would often ask you to wait uh, for about uh, 12 or 18 months before you do the post assessment. Because if I do a workshop today of DEI and I've learned, and then you're doing a post assessment, you might get a false positive. So we say, wait a bit so that the message must simmer so that people must check whether indeed there is a change. And then in your post assessment, you can then compare the shift between what you found here and what you found here in the pre-assessment. It truly is a practical tool that I've seen uh, people like, especially if you work even with engineering department, they like knowing what step are we in? What are we achieving? Where are we? Where are the gaps? So you can guide them in a way that makes sense. And along the way, which I'm not talking to here, but along the way, there's a lot of coaching uh, because some leaders need handholding where you are coaching them, you are guiding them uh, throughout this, this process. Uh, Zahid, you must tell me if my time is gone. I forgot to check the time. Um, so, and then what, what, when I spoke about, how much time am I left with? I think Nini, uh, the, uh, time is up, but um, nevertheless, you oh, can okay. take maybe two to two to three more minutes so that uh, we, that will uh, take out of the uh, question answer session. Oh, okay. So I, I say that the most important thing is not to forget that the courageous conversations are needed when we go through uh, this journey as leaders. We need to go through that. Let me just skip and show you this. Um, that leaders need to confront what we call the pain points by holding these courageous conversations. Okay, Tola, I like it when he said, whatever you fight, you strengthen. What you resist, persist. If you want to get hold of the honey, is what uh, Kenneth Gaunda said, you need to be prepared to be stung by the bees. These conversations are difficult and leaders need to put themselves first by saying, yes, I can be vulnerable through psychological safety and be able to then uh, ensure that the impact that I have is, uh, uh, helps uh, the organization. So lastly, the strategic areas that through this journey, the 10 step journey that I showed you in this particular case study, we were able to identify five things that um, needed serious change around recruitment, um, around promotions to say what is happening. There needs to be clear criteria, strict criteria for promotion and also development, closely monitoring the profile of people you are sending for development programs. Sometimes we found in this organization that women were sent on three day, two day program and some of the male employees went to three months Harvard programs. You need to even compare that, that the quality and the spend on a development program, is it equitable? And retention, who gets retained and who leaves and comes back in the organization? And then on inclusive cultures that what is it that we can do in terms of ensuring that the culture continues to be inclusive. All of this, if you combine it, is that it does impact positively uh, in the organization. Let me rather stop there uh, it, to come with the questions. The questions will, will I'll then go more in detail. But I, I really think that if you follow a guided uh, a step practically, I have seen people benefiting from from a journey like this thank you excellent thank you so much so we have i think four more minutes left for the question answers and a couple of questions that appear in the chat box one of them by kiong who is from china nini uh, kiong is of the view that uh, you know how do you approach uh, to, uh, the people with the criminal record because they obviously have a disadvantage in the jobs so uh, since the, the equity uh, and particularly the inclusion is, is a key component of the successful D&I in the organization. So do you have some say on that? 
Of course, you know, organizations have, have things like social and ethics committee. I like it when you spoke about the ESGs because the S is for social. Um, uh, boards have what is called social and ethics committee. There are certain things that are straightforward, ethics. You don't mix uh, issues of criminal record with, and then you call it is inclusion. No, inclusion has to be very clear what we're talking about. When people have criminal records, the organization's governance and the risk profile in the first place when they enter the organization should have sorted those those things out so that we don't mix them with issues of inclusion. Excellent. So one of the uh, alumni of this program, Marta, uh, who is asking a question, what's the ideal timings for such a complex implementation in order not to lose the momentum? Sorry, what's the question? The, uh, it's in the chat box. So what's the ideal oh. timings for such a complex implementation in order not to lose the momentum with the healthy end employees? Do you know what I've seen in terms of the ideal time? It You'd rather take time in the beginning, communicating and getting buy-in. Because if you rush that part and go to implementation, then it's a false start. Where I've seen, even where people say, but you, you know, when are we getting to the point? I say, let's rather get more people buy into the process so that they know why we are doing this. Once people know the vision, then once you start implementing, then the timing, of course, also the timing is dependent on the size of the organization. But I believe in communicating more longer so that you get a, a buy-in as opposed to rush to implement what you didn't communicate. Nice. So, <clears throat> sorry, Halid Nasser from, who is the general manager in one of the uh, big group, uh, group of companies say that other than the surveys, is there an opportunity to, uh, you know, monitor the effectiveness of the D&I? Halid Sab, I also have something to say with regards to the impact metrics in my presentation, but I would like to like Nini to comment if she has something to say. That that if you are, sorry. Uh, he is asking about uh, any uh, anything other than the survey to understand the effectiveness of the DEI, DEI interventions. Yes, I think for me, you know, there's there's two things. Number one, the survey and the benchmarks themselves, because they would actually show you that if, if you did the benchmarks in the beginning, and then after a while you did, you can see the shift without necessarily doing the survey the way I've shown the survey. But there is nothing that beats talking to people. You know, when you engage and talk to people, they'll tell you that we can feel that the atmosphere is actually shifting and changing in the organization. Engaging with people, engaging with your customers, and engaging with your external stakeholders, I truly feel that that there are multiple ways in which you can do that. And podcast, I've seen if you haven't tried it as well, to ensure that those leaders who are doing well in their different business units, how do you develop communities of practice so that they record like short three minutes pod, uh, podcast of what they are doing well, so that you have a central system where people can log in to learn what other leaders are doing well. And it becomes sort of a cross pollination of good good tasks there super so two people have raised their hand and i would like to give them an opportunity and request them to be as brief as possible and thanks uh, nini for the very uh, i think crisp answers uh umar raza butta uh, please go ahead with your question thank you very much uh nini thank you for the for the presentation just uh, quick uh, questions in regard to South Africa, where you are working uh, for so long, is there any legislation also done in South Africa in terms of the diversity and inclusion by the government? And number two is how many companies in uh, uh, South Africa are actually uh, using diversity and inclusion into their policy frameworks? We actually have you. We have no less than eight pieces of legislation. Uh, about diversity and inclusion from employment equity to basic conditions of employment to black economic empowerment. We have a lot of pieces of legislation on that guide uh, employment equity. And yes, we also have, um, as I said, that through the boards, the social and ethics committee are supposed to be asking organizations that what are you doing um, in terms of employment equity? What are you doing in terms of your 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 social uh, environmental transformation? So they are forced to report at a board. They are forced to report to government department of labor. They are forced to, to report to trade and industry. So there's even multiple report uh, points and diversity and inclusion has to be central to everything that we do. It's a very, it's a highly measured 
a, a topic. Wonderful. And uh, last one, I'm Mohammed Abel Pascal, who is also from the Africa. Pascal, please go ahead with your question. Thank you, Zani. Thanks, Zani. How? How are you doing? I'm good, and you, Mohammed. Thank you. My question is that regardless of the diversity aspects you an organization is looking at, can you still do it without focusing on equity? Because it seems as if sometimes if an organization is looking at, let's say, at the C suite level to get, let's say, gender uh, yeah. uh, representation female in certain roles, uh, sometimes, you know, depending on the 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 area you find yourself within the globe some have advanced you have ladies in those position already in some areas they are now coming up you are growing them gradually but depending on the choices like you mentioned can you still do it without focusing on equity because sometimes if you are not careful you end up not getting the right uh, talent and because of what you wanted to do you will be focusing much on the gender and not really looking at the equity. That's what I, I want us. I want yeah. you to. to uh, yeah. Of, often, I've, I've often said that the problem, you know, with the onset of inclusion, the last few years, inclusion came in very strongly. And then we found some organizations that says, oh, okay, let's put a pause on equity, include everybody without checking whether you have really leveled uh, the playing field. So you can, you can focus on just inclusion, but it just depends on how unequitable your organization is. Because inclusion, as you know, we, we, we're saying it's, you know, inviting people to 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 join the party that's diversity and you know uh, they come to dance that's inclusion but what is important is that yes while you include people because inclusion is the culture you are recruiting me into what culture and do i feel that i belong do i feel that i belong here but at the same time am i treated fairly and equitably so all the three have to go together but you have to be monitoring all the time that you know we have done enough maybe we have brought in enough women or people of color or people with disabilities it, it has to be constantly an area of monitoring but you can other people have just focused on inclusion okay thank Super. you so i think uh, very interesting questions and uh, by the, all the participants and the exciting uh, comments by the speakers uh, the session is on I, I, another brilliant speaker speaker i'm sure Rita is going to introduce so nini once again thank you so much uh, you. for the very insightful talk uh, uh, depending upon your availability, you may like to stay on. Yeah, the I'll, or I'll stay on. Okay. Thank you once again. So over to you, Rida. All right. Thank you so much, Nini. It was actually a very interesting presentation. So um, the next speaker that we have is Jamal Nasser. And in the past few years, Habib Bank Limited, which is Pakistan's largest commercial bank, has made a remarkable progress on the DEI front. And thus, our next distinguished speaker, Jamal Nasser, who is the Chief Human Resource Officer at HBL, will be speaking about HBL's DEI footprint and journey, making a change in the new age. Jamal has over 30 years of professional experience. And prior to joining HBL, he was the Group Executive HR at UBL. He has worked with the Standard Chartered Bank as Head of HR for Pakistan and Head of HR for South Asia. He later relocated with Standard Chartered Bank to Singapore into the role of head of HR for Southeast Asia. Prior to working with Standard Chartered Bank, Jamal was also the country head human resources at ABN AMRO Pakistan and also has 10 years work experience at Angro, which was in the past the Exxon Chemical. He's currently on the board of governors for the Pakistan Society for Training and Development and is also a trustee of the HBL Foundation. Jamal Nasser is a BS in Electrical Engineering from the University of Texas at Austin and an MBA from the Institute of Business Administration, Karachi. Thank you very much, Jamal, for joining us today. And over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it, Rita. Um, uh, have you uh, granted me rights for me to be able to share my screen? Uh, yes, yeah. I have. You, you have. Thank you. Uh, wait a minute. That let me just try and just bear with me for a second. I'm just going to share my screen.
Excellent. We can see that. Thank you. Uh, can you see it in full screen or not yet? Uh, if you go to the presentation mode, we can see your screen, but uh, uh, you may like to go to the full display. Yeah, this is perfect now. Is this okay now? Good, yeah. good. Yeah. Appreciate it. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for the invite, uh, Zahid. Uh, pleasure to be here. And uh, uh, look, look, what, what, what you're going to try and do, what I'll do in the next 20 minutes uh, is to try and you know share with you uh, uh, from a practitioner's point of view in terms of how, as an organization, uh, we've traversed the, the, the journey on, on, on diversity and, and inclusion as well. So, so really, there, there are going to be three aspects I'll, I'll, uh, that I'll, you know, I'll touch upon. One is, you know, obviously, the, the uh, gender diversity within the organization. And I'll spend more time on that than the other two, which is, you know, we're going to just, I'll, I'll spend you know, a couple of minutes on, on uh, when we look at diversity, we're also looking at the uh, at the PWDs, which are people with disabilities, in terms of how we're trying to you know be an inclusive organization for them. And I'll also you know just you know, briefly share with you uh, that you know when we talk about diversity, we don't just look at gender diversity uh, as far as employees are concerned. We look at uh, we look at gender diversity across the whole country, and and so we look at you know uh, you know uh, women customers as an integral part of what this organization stands for. So I just, you know, towards the end, I'll just share a little bit around, around that area in terms of what we do. Uh, so let me, let me just uh, move on. Uh, I, I'll, you know, because, you know, Zayed has given me 20 minutes, I'll try and be, uh, I'll try and run through some of the slides. So, but if you do want me to stop and, and, and you know, talk a little more about a particular area, you know, uh, please raise your hand. And, and, you know, Zahid, I'd appreciate if you could help me. And if somebody does raise a hand, if you could just, you know, flag it to me, it'll be helpful. Thank you. Uh, look, um, this is a journey that, uh, that you know, is, is important for us. So when we talk about diversity, uh, we, we've been on this journey for a long time. Uh, and, and, I, and I'm going to share a little bit of, a little down the road, I'll share some numbers with you as well. But uh, uh, prior to 2004, uh, this, you know, uh, the bank was was nationalized, was was part of the government, uh, and then it was it was privatized, and that's that's when the current shareholders, you know, uh, bought the controlling stake. And ever since then, we've been on this journey because what's what's important as an institution is that you know we that we focus on women development uh, in Pakistan, and and with that, when, when I what I mean by that is both uh, financial inclusion. For, for, for the women folk uh, of Pakistan in general, and then also focusing on, on, the, on, on, on uh, women as, as employees uh, uh, within the bank. Uh, as an institution, as, as I had said, we are the largest bank in Pakistan. Uh, we have assets worth roughly around $25 billion. Uh, and and we, we, you know, overall we employ uh, you know, more than 25,000 uh, employees in Pakistan and in 12 countries uh, uh, outside. Uh, you know, of the of these, the permanent FTEs are, are roughly around 18,000 uh, that that we employ. So that's just a little bit. Uh, we have we have around 1,700 branches that we operate in, in Pakistan and in the 12 countries abroad. Uh, so we we're a, we're a large institution. Uh, we have been obviously been uh, we we've continuously been growing in terms of our our, our profitability. Uh, but as we grow more and more, it's more the focus is more around digital uh, than, than than physical uh, brick and mortar branches. So that's a little bit around the context of of you know who we are and and you know the size and scale of our, our, our operations. Now now uh, look uh, so so when when we talk about uh, when we talk about diversity. Uh, this is we, we uh, gender wise we the two areas uh, as I mentioned we focus on is is financial inclusion and and uh, and and you know employees. Now, when when we when we were privatized as an institution in two thousand and four from the government, uh, the the percentage of of females uh, uh, in in the bank was only three percent. Uh, as of yesterday, we, we were at roughly 19.5%. Uh, uh, 
so we've been on that journey ever since, and we've gone from 3% to, to roughly 20%, uh, you know, uh, which, which we will close at this year. So it's been a steady growth. It's been a consistent growth, if you see. Uh, the other thing that, you know, we've, you know, I've, I've, we've gone as an institution, as, as an executive committee, we've gone and committed to the board is that we're targeting to increase that to roughly around 25% by 2025. Now, when I say 20%, uh, you know, end of this year, that's roughly around 4,000 uh, 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 female employees that we would have. As, as, as with 4,000, we, we're possibly one of the largest employers of uh, uh, ladies in, in, in the country. Um, so, so what is our high level strategy? Uh, it's, it's really about, you know, uh, we do a lot of work around making sure that we're able to hire uh, a lot of females. Now you have to understand, and especially for, for the participants here from, from outside Pakistan, um, it, it, the society in which we operate, uh, there's some areas in, in, in Pakistan, especially in the north, in the, you know, uh, in the areas bordering uh, Afghanistan, et cetera, very, very few females would want to come and work, very, very, very few. And, and really our focus is, is trying to make headway in some of those areas as well, so that we're able to attract for them to come in and, and work for us. You know, our ultimate ambition is when there's a girl out there in university wanting, thinking about making a career, the first name that should come to her mind is, is HBL. And that's really, that's really what drives us and that's the focus. So the numbers that I talked about, you know, 20% this year, 20, you know, 25 by 2025, 20, that's, that's really an outcome of what we're trying to do. We, we don't get overly obsessed with the numbers. Yes, yeah, we, 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 you know, we, we bankers, you know, we, we do have uh, financial targets and bid prices that we look at and, and focus on and, and make sure we're driving our performance around you know, and be able to measure some of the stuff that we're doing. But it's really about our focus is really about creating an environment within the organization where you know females will want to come and work and thrive in. And, and that's, you know, if you're looking at the, uh, the, at the market here, the Pakistani society and the cultural nuances that we have in the country, uh, it's, it's very important that, you know, as, you know, most of the females and ladies are work, you know, when they're starting the careers, they're living with the parents. Parents are very, very, you know, protective and wanting to make sure whether, whether if one, if they're you know, allowing them to go and work, number two, if they're allowing them to go and work to make, making sure that there's an environment where, where they will be protected and safe. So that's, that's, that's a huge focus area for us. Uh, so yeah, so we we, work, we we right now we're working with a number of universities, the female-only universities in Pakistan, various parts, uh, and 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 really creating a share of mind, and in really helping and assisting these universities in developing curriculum, uh, etc., where they start to learn about financial services, so that then they start to think about making careers in in in, in banks as well. So we do a lot of that. We're hiring a lot of fresh young talent. Uh, which are female only uh, batches, which we bring in. So you know, if somebody would ask me a question, do we, do, is, 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 are we biased towards them? Yes, to some extent, yes, because what's important is we provide help. We, we, when we do some of this stuff uh, in terms of you know, trying to create a more level playing field for them. So to bringing more in, helping them grow, developing them, and, and, and really you know, trying to fast track some of the, you know, the, the, the the ones that we have and who are doing very well. So that's, we continue to focus on that. Now, I'll just talk about some of the different areas that we, that we focus on and, 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 and work on. Now, uh, you know, as far as representation is concerned, you know, uh, I'll just talk about one or, one or two things. Uh, right now, the, the, the biggest job, single job that I have in the bank is, is the, the person who heads branch operations. As I said, 1,700 branches, we have roughly around 4,000 individuals who work in branch operations. And, and the person who's heading it is, is our lady. And we put her into that role uh, you know, last year. Uh, and it's part of our fast tracking some of our talent and taking them to executive committee levels uh, and, 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 and really uh, helping them grow and, and, and challenging them and putting them in roles 
where, where you know, we will continue to take risk. We take risk on, on all our high potentials, but you know, we, we're more, more focused around trying to fast track uh, you, know, the, 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 you know, the high potential ladies that we have and putting them in interesting roles. So that's, that's, you know, that's by design and, and, and we, we do a lot of that. On the, on the government side, there's a couple of things that I'll talk about. One is the fact that you know, we have, we've set up a diversity council uh, roughly 50%, and most of these people, most of the folks in this are very senior individuals of our exec, uh, extended leadership team, 50% males, 50% females. And the person who's the chairman or the chairperson of the diversity council is our head of technology who's a male. And, 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 and the reason we do some of these things is, is because, look, when, when we talk about diversity, my view is to drive diversity, it's a man thing. You change the men's thought process. This process, the, the diversity agenda, will drive itself, and that's so. That's why it's important for us that there is there is strong collaboration between senior men and senior females in the organization who get together and drive the the diversity agenda. So they monitor what we're doing, the projects that we're doing, the learning interventions that we're doing, uh, you know, reviewing the the, the the high potentials. Uh, uh, female leaders that we have in the organization, uh, monitoring nutrition, monitoring uh, all the intakes that we're bringing in. So the diversity council meets roughly, you know, every six to eight weeks, uh, and then focuses on, on all of these areas. Each diver each diversity council member is then responsible for certain actions and projects that are that we focus on in this area. So that's the that's the you know. Uh, terms of reference and the, and the role for the diversity council. It's 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 worked for us, and, and it, it's it's a very very effective tool. The second piece, I, the second thing I'll mention as far as far as uh, governance is concerned, every executive committee member of this bank, all of them, have diversity targets in their annual goals, and it's monitored. It's monitored by it's monitored by you know of the, the CEO. Uh, it's monitored by as an executive committee collectively, which we do, and we also present an, on a quarterly basis to the board uh, in terms of where we are with the diversity initiatives and, and the diversity numbers. So, so there's a strong tracking mechanism that we have set up. Uh, uh, look, we, 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 we collaborate with, with the likes of the IFC, uh, you know, Financial Alliance for Women, uh, the Commonwealth Development Corporation, uh, in, in Pakistan as well, you know, we, we work with with you know, Zayed's organization uh, in a number of areas. Uh, so, so we 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 want to and we look at collaborations, uh, international organizations as well as as well as local. Uh, on the training front, I just spent you know a couple of minutes. Um, the the two or three things that we did in 2015 uh, or, and 16, we worked with IFC and we developed a gender sensitization training. And, and we, we put roughly 11,000 of our employees through it, mostly our branch networks and our senior management. And then, you know, three, around 2017, uh, early 2018, IFC came back and said, look, we'd like to do an impact analysis. I said, sure, makes sense for us, come and do it. So they went out there and they analyzed branches that had been through this training and branches that had not. And they found a very strong correlation where, the branches that had gone through this training, the number of female customers was at least, I think, 17% higher. The deposits in the, in the female customers' accounts were 12% higher. And how females and males perceived each other as colleagues, the, the level of engagement there in those branches was, was seven percentage points higher than what it was in the branches that had not gone through training strong correlation. And, and so this intervention that IFC did, they won global awards for that, for the intervention they did with, with HBL. Uh, what we're working with right now is, again, we, we, now we're working with CDC this year. We've rolled out a new program around gender smart banking. We've trained the trainers. Now we're going to take you know most of the organization through it over next year. Similarly, we're also developing another program around, around professional uh, female bankers. And we, we're going to be putting around three thousand of our uh, uh, three thousand of uh, of our of our you know employees through that as well next year. So there's a strong focus on 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 training that that we do. Uh, 
pay, you know, the gender, like I said, when I started, I think we're trying what, what's important for us to be creating the right kind of environment within the organization. So that's what our main focus is. That's what we, that's what we continue to, to drive. Uh, we do, we, we do a lot of mentoring, you know, so females, uh, uh, senior females mentoring, you know, high potential females in the organization, senior executive committee members mentoring, uh, uh, high potential senior females in the organization. Uh, we, 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 like I said, you know, we, we operate in the entire length and breadth of Pakistan. Uh, we have diversity champions in each and every region in which we operate. We have around 19 regions where we operate. Everyone has a diversity champion and, and their, their, their role, in addition to their day-to-day -day job, their role is to really push uh, the, and, and drive the, the uh, diversity agenda in each of the regions. So that's some of the things that we that we're looking at driving. So that's a little bit around around uh, our diversity. The other piece in the last you know two years, two and a half years, which we've been pushing again as part of our diversity and inclusion agenda, is is working with people uh, with with you know uh, with PWDs. So there's a lot of focus. Uh, we you know we're making sure that all our buildings and now going forward branches are accessible for both. Uh, again, like I said. But just like for diversity, again, what we're trying to focus on is not just uh, a PWD as employees, but we're also focusing on PWD as customers. And that's you know one of the critical elements uh, when you're trying to drive these change agendas is it shouldn't be looked at and seen as an internal initiative. That's not what it is. We what we're trying doing, or what we're trying to do, both with you know diverse, gender diversity as well as PWDs is trying to embed this in our in our DNA. And that it takes time. It takes, like I said, you, I showed you the journey of, of which we were on. Uh, similarly, you know, we've embarked on this journey. So various uh, aspects we're focusing on, you know, bringing them in, hiring them both ourselves, getting some of our contractors and other people who work for us, getting them to hire. Uh, we just last week, we've rolled out uh, a diversity uh, 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 PWD, uh, uh, e-learning, which is going to be mandatory for all staff. So everyone gets to understand, you know, what PWDs are, uh, and how do you, how do you interact with them? How do you engage them? How do you talk to them as employees and as customers? So there's a lot of that learning that we're trying to cascade throughout the, uh, the, the organization, assigning buddies, uh, internship programs to help them understand and come and experience banks. As, 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 as employment opportunities. And we're working with a number of external uh, organizations, NGOs who work in the space uh, uh, to help us uh, and, and you know, give us that expertise, uh, both in terms of learning, uh, how do we help them assimilate? How do we get some of the equipment that are required for them to be able to be productive at work? And so there are various aspects that we and various areas that we're working on. Lastly, I, know I did mention that you know, uh, the, the, we were looking at at, at uh, you know uh, gender diversity as far as you know uh, our customers are concerned. Uh, in 2016, we we set up a new brand within the bank, which was uh, HBL Nissa. Nissa stands, you know, this this is our our female uh, financial services proposition. So we have very customized uh, products and services for our our female customers, and our focus is around you know a lot of you know, we do a lot of around financial literacy awareness. So we are, 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 some of our senior folks go to these remote areas where they get people together. We tell them about what savings are, what financial inclusion is all about. And, and 75 of those of the percentage of those participants are females. And 90% and, and of the time we open their accounts there and then on, on that site to help them with financial inclusion, for them to start to, Save because in in, in uh, you know just like in other places in Pakistan the ladies and the women at at home are the ones who take a lot of the financial decisions, and and it's important for them to understand you know what financial inclusion is, what savings are, and how they should be saving for you know for for various uh, for various reasons. So there's a lot of that work that we do. Uh, uh, there's a lot of lending that we have been doing to female entrepreneurs, SMEs run by uh, uh, females who may have a very specific product that, we, that, we, that we've rolled out and to support you know, some of these uh, uh, females. Lastly, 
Look, there's a lot of, you know, when we talk about financial inclusion, uh, you know, uh, we have we have a branchless bank proposition where you can go to one of these you know, small, uh, you know, uh, the roadside uh, vendor and who who, become, who we make our agent and that's our HBL Connect brand. And so you can go and deposit money, withdraw money, pay your utility bills, et cetera. Uh, now what we're focusing on is appointing female shop owners as connect agents so that more females customers can then go to them and feel more comfortable going in and, and conducting some of the transactions. Uh, the, the other other pieces that we work on is, you know, we've, uh, uh, as part of the, the government's endeavor to be able to support the low, lower segments of the society, uh, they, they have been giving out social security uh, money uh, since, especially uh, for, since last year, and, and you know, to a smaller extent over the last five or six years. And, and HBL is the main channel through which they disburse this money. So we set up camps, we go through our connect agents, all these, these ladies, and most of the recipients are, are these uh, ladies from the lower segment of society. They will come to us and they will withdraw uh, the money that, you know, that the government is wanting to pay to them. So we are, we are the main channel that they use. The other places, you know, the other areas that we you know we try to do it, be, be, be present is, is supporting females in technology. Because as I mentioned at the start, our future is all technology. It's not the brick and mortar branches. So we've been investing heavily on technology. At the same time, you know, we're trying to blend uh, uh, females who are in, who work in that space and who are doing entrepreneurial work in the digital space and, and bringing them in and supporting them and where they bring come up with certain uh, uh, projects, uh, you know, we, HBL goes out there and you know, funds a lot of them as well. So we're trying to cover all aspects of the ecosystem. So from, from individual ladies who are, who are wanting to de develop themselves, entrepreneurs, uh, lower end of the segment, financial inclusion, and, and finally, uh, you know, and, and, and looking at ladies as, as employees. So hey, I just you know I just tried to uh, Zaid, I hope I haven't overrun on my time, but what I've tried to cover, I know I'm sorry there was a lot of material. I just wanted, um, you know, I'm greedy by nature. I wanted to be able to share whichever I could, uh, which would be helpful. But but you know the the intent was to you know, share with you uh, a snippet of of some of the areas that we work on and focus on. I'd be happy to to answer any questions of any particular area that you any one of you may have. Zaid, over to you. Excellent. But I think uh, one of the comments, uh, uh, Jamal, that I have that no doubt HBL uh, has uh, moved forward with a very progressive and a 360 view of this, uh, by taking a 360 view of the strategy, and that's one of the reason that in the uh, overall industry, it is acting as a powerhouse of the diversity and inclusion. And I think a great work uh, being done by yourself and your team. Uh, anyone having any question or comment, uh, please feel free to uh, share your uh, question. Okay, one of the questions I think by one of the speaker is that, have you found any comparisons with the loans repayment trends? Uh, I think uh, between the men and the women, this is with regard to the product that you offer. Yeah, generally, generally, uh, uh, obviously there will be, you know, uh, specific uh, uh, cases, but generally the repayment uh, uh, track record for females is is better than what you would see uh, coming from from uh, male customers. Now, obviously, the the sample sizes are very different. You know, the the the, the number of of of, uh, of female customers that we have is considerably considerably lower than what you would have in males. But based on if you look at percentages, we have a better recovery rate, definitely. Excellent. So another question by Tamina, who is based in Canada. So Tamina, question is that uh, uh, you know, can I, can you elaborate on the gender training? Uh, because I think Tamina, you referred to this question. So I think sometime back also I connected you with Jamal. So, but I would like everyone to know about because I think your training uh, profile and the kind of trainings you're uh, you're offering. Uh, that has a lot of uh, say in the industry. So I would like you to, uh, you know, give okay. more, inf more information about that. Okay. 
look, I, let me let me also backtrack. You know, something. You know, for for example, when I when I, when I said you know we try and create an environment uh, that is conducive. Uh, another thing that we do as part of that is is you know we run uh, anti harassment training, which is mandatory for each and every employee. New employees coming in have to take that e-learning within the first two months of joining, and and we look at harassment as a as a you know holistically and as a bigger issue and challenge rather than purely focusing on sexual harassment. So so what we what we we what we cover there is things like what harassment is. So ninety percent of the cases that get reported to us are verbal harassment. They're not sexual harassment. Uh, so we, we 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 give them a higher level understanding of what harassment because we're trying to create an environment which is conducive for both males and females. Uh, so we, we we tell them what harassment is. We tell them what channels they have to report. We tell them what what the process would be when somebody reports. And 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 so this is a mandatory e-learning for everyone to go through and understand. Because you know the kind of society and cultural uh, you know, challenges that we have, some folks you know somewhere in a remote branch may feel it's fine if you know if I can you know if I'm if I'm the branch manager I can stand up and you know, start cussing, and that's fine. So, but it's important for people to understand what is acceptable and what is not, and and so that is what we, why we do a lot of these trainings. Second thing. Uh, you know, when I, when I talked about the, the gender sensitization training that we started in 15 and went on and did it till 16, I just want to give you one actual experience. So, so they were running this, they were, they were running this program, it was a two day long program. They were running it on the second day. So I went by that program just to, you know, just sit there for you know, 10 or 15 minutes to see what was, what conversations were happening. And, and, and a branch manager from a remote branch came to me and said, uh, this has absolutely changed my thought process. I said, okay. And, and so you know, what do you mean by that? Uh, and, and, and what's changed? He said, look, you, what, you to, what you told us here and what you're trying to you know, uh, teach us here is how we need to interact with our female uh, uh, colleagues and how we need to look at females as and ladies as as you know potential customers, but you know, after having gone through this, how I see and interact with my when my wife, my daughters, and my sisters will change. Because what you've helped me understand is how the differences between how women and men think and why they act and not act the way they do. And, and that was, you know, that, that was the gender sensitization training and that's what our real core purpose was. And, and so it, it, was, it, was, it was absolutely, you know, phenomenal to hear that from him. Uh, and, and here is, you know, this was a branch manager in an in a, in a area which is very tribal. So, so those are the kind of changes you try and bring about through these trainings. But it's not something that you train and then you forget. It has, you have to continuously reinforce and you have to then you know, do new things and so that you, people keep learning. That's why what we did, we've done, now we've, you know, uh, earlier this year, we started on the gender smart banking uh, 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 training. So there's a lot of different, like I said, we, we work with international organizations and institutions so that we bring international best in class uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, methodologies to 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 our folks here. So, so you have to continuously learn. You have to continuously be able to you know put people on the on and 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 refresh their knowledge and understanding and and keep getting them to keep thinking about you know what's the right thing to do. Um, so that that's really what we try and do. I, I hope I've answered your question. If there's anything very specific that you want to ask me, you know, please do so. I think you uh, answered it very well, probably just for the how part of it. Thank you so much. So last question, probably, I think there's a more uh, interesting questions are also coming up, but respecting the uh, time frame, I, I would like to consider the last question for your segment, uh, Howard from US. He's asking about that, uh, to what degree has the spread of mobile banking in Pakistan increased 
women direct access to the financial services? It's, yeah, that's, that's, that's really helping. And uh, we, we still, you know, I, I would say we're still at a rudimentary stage. Uh, just to give you a sense, you know, we, um, a, a, as an institution, we right now have roughly 24 million customers. Uh, and of those 24 million, three and a half million use our apps. We have a couple of apps. One is the main banking app. The other is HBL Connect, which, are, which is our branchless banking proposition. So the, 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 the take-up rate us is still low, but that's, that's where we've been pushing, number one. Number two, with COVID, I think that's really helped. And that's helping more on the female. I, uh, if I remember right, uh, of all the, the last year of the new signups, uh, I think 35% have been ladies. So that, that percentage is, is high and it's growing. And I think that's really what, so they don't have to physically come out of the house. They don't have to come to a branch. Uh, they can do all the, all the, all the uh, uh, you know, transactions of, of, their, of, the, of their apps. And the other thing that I mentioned was we do a lot of financial literacy training in some of the more backward and remote areas. And like I said, when we gather people around, these are sometimes the small villages. When we gather those people around, at least normally 75%, we make sure are, are, are ladies. And when they come in, and like I said, you know, of the of the of all the people who come, you know, to those uh, literacy, uh, you know, uh, programs, we try and you know open accounts for at least ninety percent of them, and most of them get operated off the app. So that because these are in villages, we, we may not even have branches there. So so that so the advent of technology and digital is is definitely definitely pushing the our agenda. Of, of financial inclusion for ladies in Pakistan. Excellent. So Jamal, thank you so much. Once again, it's always a Pleasure. treat to listen to your thoughts and updates on the uh, what your organization is doing on that diversity, equity, and inclusion. With this, I request uh, Rida to move to the next speakers. And uh, we are young. I hope you're comfortable that we would like to address your question, but with the help of them uh, through some other speaker. Would that be OK? Thank you. Thank you so much, Jamal. It was indeed quite interesting to hear about what HPL is doing when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion in your organization. So the next speaker that we have is Mirla Spagwick. Um, as you all know, that since the outbreak of COVID-19, when a major part of the workforce started working remotely, much attention has certainly been drawn to one topic across the globe, and that is work-life integration. So today we have with us Mirla Spagovic, the Director of People and Culture at Philip Morris Pakistan Limited, who will be sharing insights about work-life integration, flexibility, and benefits at Philip Morris International. Mirla completed her master's in international and domestic trade from the University of Belgrade. Her journey in Philip Morris International of almost 10 years has been a multifaceted one, as she has taken up on roles in multiple affiliates across the world and domains within the people and culture function. In 2017, Mirla joined the EEMA and DFPNC regional team, where she has been a valued member for the past years, starting as the manager of talent management and inclusion and diversity, to becoming the PNC head for the Eastern Europe region. In 2021, she moved to Pakistan from Lausanne as director of people and culture. She has been a driving force of all regional initiatives, including talent and inclusion and diversity plans and actions, employee listening, leadership, development, and engagement activities. So we look forward to hearing more from you, Mirla, and over to you now. Okay, thank you. I hope uh, everybody can hear me uh, very well. Um, thank you very much for this invitation. Uh, I'm honored to be here and to speak to all of you. Um, I'm sure that Rida will help me also with the presentation and I'm very thankful for that part as well. Uh, as well. And regarding my presentation, I will not be focusing only uh, on the topic, 
topic that has been mentioned, but would like to give a little bit of more uh, around uh, uh, Philip Morris International, what we are trying to do globally. Uh, we'll talk also about inclusion and diversity and definitely we'll cover uh, work and life integration and flexibility and benefits here, uh, focusing on a couple of particularly important things for us. Before going to that, I would also like to talk a little bit about Philip Morris International again, uh, what we are trying to do globally and also uh, what uh, we are doing here in Pakistan uh, and uh, how we are taking on some global in initiatives uh, here. So if I can go to the first slide. Um, the first slide is actually uh, about our transformation journey. Um, I'm, I don't know if you know, but uh, we are uh, really uh, transforming our business and uh, we have a very bold global vision about smoke free future, which is actually something quite different, having in mind that we are uh, still a tobacco company and particularly here in Pakistan, we are uh, a pure tobacco company. Uh, the, the big journey that we have and the transformation that we have in, uh, ahead of us uh, has been for some time and uh, we have to thank all our people across PMI uh, because uh, the reason or actually the, they are the main drivers for this transformation, their imagination and uh, perseverance what we want to achieve. And this can be also very new for you. We want to become a science and technology company, a science and technology leaders. And so far we have invested more than uh, $8.1 billion into, uh, dollars into science and research. And in this very moment, we are hiring around more than 900 uh, world-class scientists, engineers, and technicians. And if you think about our practices that we can have currently in our company, uh, we are actually applying standards from pharmaceutical industry. We are trying really hard uh, to uh, put those standards uh, in, in place. And uh, uh, our findings are uh, available for anyone uh, to review. And we also require from all our employees and from third party suppliers, partners actually to respect our views and respect our standards. And the last thing that is extremely important for us is actually sustainability. It uh, stands at the core of uh, our transformation uh, and uh, it also help us uh, with innovation, uh, it uh, help us with our growth and it help us with the long-term uh, value creation. Those are a couple of things about PMI that I wanted really to share uh, with you before I talk about uh, uh, other topics and the topic that I will continue talking about is actually what does it mean for our employees and how do we look at our employees in Philip Morris. So next slide, uh, if possible. Um, first, what we say in, in, in Philip Morris, we say that uh, we drive people's centricity. What does it mean? That means that we put our people uh, in the focus of all our activities uh, and we listen to them, we hear them, and we try to adjust, implement, and uh, come up with new solutions that will address employees' needs. Next thing, we drive flexibility, and I will talk about uh, uh, our practice uh, uh, on that front. And one of the most important priorities uh, is uh, diversity and inclusion. Uh, and uh, I will also uh, touch upon the, this, these topics very, very briefly. So next slide. So, uh, inclusion and diversity, I think uh, Jamal has already spoken about uh, uh, experience and they'll also talk about this uh, uh, very briefly. Uh, we see diversity as our strength and uh, in PMI, we are fully committed in building uh, an inclusive culture uh, and uh, workplace that really reflects world's diversity. What you, you have to know about us, we are actually a big multinational company. Uh, we have more than 80,000 employees across the world. And in the same time, we operate in more than 90 countries. What we want is actually that 
this kind of diversity is represented in our management teams, in uh, our boards, in uh, our regional management teams, and in our local management teams. Uh, to boost that diversity, and it's very clear for us, we have really to ensure that our culture is inclusive. Uh, and on that front, we are really focused on creating an environment that really provides equal opportunity to everybody. So people working for PMI can really use their skills, share their ideas, give their perspective, and what is the most important, they feel valued while working for us. And we don't look about the origin. And as you can see, I come from a different uh, uh, environment. Uh, I used to work uh, in Eastern Europe. I'm originally from Eastern Europe. I used to support Middle East and Africa. Uh, I spent a year, a beautiful year, in Johannesburg in South Africa. Uh, I worked for four years in Switzerland. And currently, I'm here uh, working uh, with uh, great people and very inspiring people here in, in, in Pakistan. In order to do that, uh, definitely uh, PMI really creates the environment that helped me really to work with the diverse people and also uh, help people in PMI uh, also to work with me to understand how different I, and I am and how different they are and uh, to appreciate our diversity. Uh, in the same time, we also understand, and I think uh, Nene has spoken about this, is actually leadership is critical. Uh, you know, if we want to build this inclu inclusive uh, culture, and we are building this, uh, but we, if we want to enhance the, the inclusiveness of our culture, lead leadership is extremely important. And on that front, uh, we, we uh, ensure that uh, different voices are heard, uh, that leadership style or our leaders can really adapt to the needs of different employees that empathy and care is something that each and every leader uh, in PMI has possessed and demonstrates, and that we also build the culture uh, um, where we have psychological safety. But so, because without psychological safety, we cannot have diversity and we cannot have the inclusive culture. We also want to break down the hierarchy, and by saying this, in, in the past, we used to be the company where uh, most of the decisions were actually uh, managed from the top to the bottom. Now, well, we have been changing for some time, and we say that bottom uh, for, to the top is equally important, if not even more important. And we also talk a lot about unconscious biases. We are fully aware that they exist, that they can uh, influence different decisions, and we are putting a lot of efforts in how to uh, um, uh, mitigate them and how to uh, help people to be aware of uh, unconscious biases and how they can influence uh, uh, our decisions. On the leadership front, definitely we have uh, uh, our global targets. Uh, our global targets is actually to achieve 40% of uh, uh, females in the managerial population. You can see here a very small chart in 2014 when we uh, set this uh, goal. It was 29% of population, managerial po population. Currently, uh, our first quarter of 2021, we were at 38.5, and we are very, very um, uh, committed to achieve 40% by uh, uh, 2022, end of 22, 2022, and I'm talking about Philip Morris globally. So next slide, if possible. I invite you also to uh, ask questions uh, um, so I can also address them later on or during the presentation. So I was talking about uh, a little bit about diversity. Now I'm going to talk about a couple of initiatives that are extremely important to, to, uh, for us. The first one is equal salary certification. Uh, we are the only company, I think still the only company uh, that uh, uh, has been certified globally, certified by the uh, independent Equal Salary Foundation. This certification really confirms that we pay equally men and women 
for the equal work, of course, uh, and it's valid or applicable for all affiliates across the world. Uh, in this moment, so how this certification really looks like, each and every affiliate it actually goes through the rigorous certification process and we need to prove not only you know to demonstrate or to show our salaries but we also have to prove that all our processes are fair and equal for both genders and i'm talking when i'm talking about the processes i'm talking about from uh, talent acquisition, uh, talent development, talent retention uh, so that all processes we really really uh, uh, treat both genders in the same way. Uh, the, the certificate is valid uh, till March 2022, but currently during this year, uh, we are actually renewing our certification uh, and uh, uh, we will actually continue with this practice because we, we say that it's not only important that we know, but for us it's extremely important that someone knows and someone who is very, very credible in this world tells to, to us, yes, you're doing the right things and you treat both the gender in the same way. This is on the um, uh, certification or uh, equal pay for equal work, which is actually the huge challenge if you think globally. And the, if you think about Pakistan, I think that this gap is around 37% in terms of equal payment uh, uh, for females and males. The second pillar that I want to, 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 to talk about, and we heard also about this, is actually diversity, is a disability. Uh, uh, we are actually part of the Valuable 500 initiative, and the purpose of this initiative is actually to put inclusion, disability inclusion, at the top of the business agenda. Uh, so this is one of the initiatives that we have, and we we. we PMI really takes it very, very seriously. We signed the document last year in December 2020. The last initiative that I wanted to share with you for this broader community is Inclusive Future. Um, we always say in PMI that it's very easy to measure diversity. Uh, so you have your data, you, understand, you can set your target and you say, okay, uh, I want to be there uh, by 2022. And it's very easy for us to measure. When it comes to how inclusive is our culture, we say that it's quite, quite difficult uh, to measure. Of course, we do have some tools. We, we do have our um, uh, employee opinion survey. Uh, we measure some of the elements, but we also want to have uh, a bit of uh, scientific uh, standards for that and in order to measure how inclusive is our culture we do have a partnership with the institute for management development in lausanne switzerland um, our hq is in, in switzerland and uh, this this um, uh, uh, external body will help us really uh, to have like the scientific proven method to measure our inclusiveness and also to put right actions to achieve the, the level of inclusion that we want. So this is actually the third initiative that I wanted to, to share with you. So if I can go to the next slide. Now I'm talking a little bit about uh, Pakistan and what we have here. And we'll also talk a little bit about inclusion and diversity. So our target for pa Pakistan and for gender balance is 2020, 22% uh, uh, of females in uh, managerial population. Currently, uh, we are below this target uh, and definitely uh, having in mind the, the context and uh, the culture here, uh, we fully understand from the PMI standpoint. And uh, for us, the most important thing is to do right things, not to achieve only figures. So we do have the target, but doing the right things is the most important versus achieving the targets. And then we talk, when we are talking about inclusion and diversity here, uh, we usually think about three main pillars. And you can see here, the first one is uh, engage, actually to engage without, uh, with uh, um, uh, our females. And uh, for that purposes, we have created something that uh, we call uh, Women Inspiration Network. The purpose of this uh, is actually um, connecting, uh, exchanging, discussing, and building the community of support for females in, 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 in uh, Philip Morris. 
Then we have different inspirational sessions, development programs and celebration sessions. This is on the engagement part, on the retained part. The most important thing is actually for everybody, not only for females, to have very clear objectives and very clear development plans, to have customized sales career uh, uh, framework for females, to provide mentoring and also to take care about work-life balance. And here you can see one of the initiatives that we have. I will not go into details. We have many, many initiatives uh, uh, here, but one is actually Power Hour. Uh, so during the day, uh, uh, each employee, not just females, can block two hours in their calendars uh, and uh, to attend some other matters. Um, uh, throughout the day, for example, spend time with the children or attend any other matter uh, that is priority for uh, our employees throughout the day. And the final thing is actually attraction. Uh, we have the, the special focus on female friendly positions. We always like to ensure that we have balanced uh, short, uh, short lists. Uh, we also have we, and we, we promote equal salary uh, certification and we, we really like to, to talk about that. And then we try really to proactively map the market and then understand how we can source. And the final piece that you can see here is the program that we launched this year uh, in, uh, in August uh, or beginning of September. Uh, we call the program Make Your Comeback. This is actually a program for uh, uh, women that uh, had the break in their careers and would like to come back to their work. And in order to that, they need perhaps new skills or they need to refresh or polish their knowledge. So we had uh, uh, currently we are going through this process with some really really good to this program through with some very very good results, and perhaps uh, in some other occasions we can share more uh, on our learnings uh, from this particular uh, program. But so far the feedback is amazing, and we are really really uh, proud of having something like this. So I can go to my next slide. Now I will talk a little bit about uh, uh, life integration, flexibility and benefits. Uh, uh, although I have to say, when we talk about benefits, uh, I think that having diversity and having inclusive culture is actually the benefits for our employees. It's the benefit for, for the company, but it's also the benefit for our employees. So that's why I'm linking the previous part with this uh, uh, part as well. So when we are talking about flexibility, uh, we globally we have uh, a program that we call Smart Work, and this is actually our model uh, of giving the opportunity to our employees to decide or to combine where do they work want to work from. They can combine between remote work and office-based work. Uh, we call it like uh, uh, they can opt for like working remotely only. They can decide to work from the office or they can work in the uh, model that we call hybrid model, which me means that actually portion of the time they can work from the office and the portion of the time they can work from home. By doing this, uh, we really uh, say that it's actually, we, we want to enhance flexibility. And what I want to say uh, is actually when it comes to the flexibility, um, it, it started before pandemic. Uh, it's for PMI, it started in 2018, if I remember correctly. Uh, and then uh, uh, th throughout 2018 and uh, 19, we had the flexibility programs uh, working differently in different uh, countries. But actually the pandemic was the accelerator, if I may call it. And uh, uh, that was actually this aha moment when we have realized, yes, we can work uh, in this mode, and it and we really, really have very, very, very good results uh, by working like this. Uh, currently in Pakistan, we are also having this uh, this program, uh, and uh, uh, we are currently completing something that we call the pilot phase. We are learning from that. Uh, if you remember previously, I was talking about uh, uh, people centricity or employee centricity. Uh, so we don't want to go and just impose something. We we'll listen our employees and we adjust uh, uh, programs to suit their needs, and it always has to be win-win uh, for both of us. 
So this is an art uh, intake on uh, uh, smart work. Uh, we also have like multiple other initiatives uh, uh, on on on, the, on that front, which also helps uh, our employees to stay connected, to stay engaged. Uh, uh, we have different uh, uh, clubs, different post podcasts, and so on and so on. On the benefits front. Um, I don't want to talk about all benefits that we have in PMI. I'm sure that a lot of companies in Pakistan or worldwide uh, uh, have uh, uh, different benefits. I want to focus on three major things uh, that I think uh, are very important uh, for us. The first one is mental uh, health, uh, uh, that the men is uh, around mental health, uh, which is actually uh, covered from our uh, insurance for all employees. Mental health is extremely important uh, uh, topic. It became uh, important uh, uh, with the kickoff of the pandemic. And I'm sure in the next couple of uh, years, it will continue to be uh, very important. We also understand that uh, it is the topic uh, uh, that uh, uh, is uh, uh, stigma in a lot of countries and a lot of regions globally, including the region where I'm coming from. Uh, and I understand also in Pakistan, people do not talk uh, about that. And sometimes they're also um, afraid to ask for support or, or, or for help. Uh, we, we say we, we don't impose anything. We offer possibilities. We have two global providers. Or actually, we, we have two providers that can support our employees if they ask for help. Uh, so the first one is LifeWorks, you can see the logo there. And then the, the, the other one is Sahat Kahani, the local one. Uh, we also leave the opportunity to employees to decide whether they would like to go with the global provider or they would like to go with the local one. Um, uh, it, 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 again, is the personal decision and personal, personal choice. Just to, to, to reinforce, we don't impose, we talk about that and we say we are offering this it's up to you to decide to go uh, and to choose or, uh, but we want to talk about that. The second thing that you see here, a part of the mental health uh, is actually something that we call uh, new and enhanced parental leaves. Uh, we understand that both the genders should participate equally in uh, uh, raising kids and children across the globe. Uh, and we started this. This is actually something new for Pakistan. We just kicked off uh, um, uh, this new benefit for our employees. Uh, globally, it started a little bit earlier in 2020 uh, and uh, in, in Pakistan in 2021. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, this means that we provide, uh, we talk about primary uh, and secondary caregiver. For primary uh, caregiver, uh, uh, we give um, uh, mandatory uh, 18 weeks of uh, uh, leave. And uh, for secondary care caregiver, which is usually his father, uh, we give uh, uh, eight weeks of uh, uh, leaves, of parental leaves. So. This is something that we are also very proud of uh, and uh, uh, not very, very rare uh, when I talk about the global situation uh, and when I talk also about uh, uh, local initiatives. Uh, and the last thing that I also want to, to introduce or to talk about, or actually to mention as one of the benefits as part of all other that we have, again, uh, is actually something that we introduced for our employees uh, uh, now in, the, in uh, November, and this is actually health screening checkups for all employees. And we always think that it's better to prevent something. Uh, than to wait, uh, and that's why we are saying, okay, it's better to to have like regular checkups and encourage our employees to do that uh, versus like really waiting and uh, uh, visiting doctors uh, uh, when perhaps it can be too late or uh, the progress is uh, uh, it requires uh, uh, like additional attention or uh, additional uh, take care. So uh, I think with this, uh, uh, I'm completing my presentation and uh, uh, I'm open for uh, any question uh, from your side uh, and very happy to address. Excellent. Uh, again, uh, very nice presentation, Mirella. Uh, so personally, I have picked up some of the topics from your presentations where I would like to touch base more. Uh, for my own understanding for, and also for the understanding of the industry, like the 
uh, equal pay certifications and the inclusion metrics and few other things. But I would like to give more opportunity to the people in the session. So Kiang from China, uh, previously he asked the question, uh, due to the shortage of the time, uh, we uh, get it forward the questions and I would like you to respond to ease of the view that is there a uh, differentiation uh, or is there a difference in the treatment to the uh, female uh, uh, who have the dependent ch children, for example, somebody having a one child and somebody having three children, is there a kind of uh, differentiation or discrimination uh, uh, by the organization in terms of giving jobs to those women? So uh, we cannot, how to say, we cannot, uh, uh, this is also discrimination if you're giving something to one group or not giving something to uh, another group. Uh, but we are also uh, aware of the possibility or actually difference or uh, between um, uh, groups. What we have in our company, and we see that working mothers are using this more, uh, is actually this possibility to lock two hours during the day uh, and attend different matters, including take care of uh, uh, children or preparing uh, meals or doing something like this. So this is, for example, one of the initiatives. The second initiative that we have, we have Women Inspiration Network only for working mothers. Um, and by establishing this group, we want to actually bring them together so they can network together, but we also want to bring and discussing topics that are important for them. Uh, so these are a couple of things that we are doing uh, uh, for them. And currently we are also reviewing a couple of additional um, um, possibilities for working mothers particularly. But when it comes to, uh, for example, acquisition or recruitment or something like this, no, we are not uh, doing anything. Um, we don't discriminate or we don't give better opportunities to working mothers. What we have now, again, I want to reinforce again the message around my comeback program. This is exactly the program that working mothers or mothers with the children can benefit from. Uh, so we are talking about women uh, that had the break in their careers for any reason, but usually that can be uh, around uh, uh, bringing up kids uh, or taking care of kids. And after uh, a while, when the kids are grown up, they want to come back. So currently we are having this program and we have uh, really uh, uh, women that had this break because of children and now they have the opportunity really uh, to learn new skills or to polish their skills and they will have a chance really to find uh, some other jobs and we are also hoping that potentially perhaps we will also be able to to give opportunities for them for the employment excellent i hope i'm addressing the question yeah absolutely now another question by martha uh, she is based in spain and she says uh, how do you explain uh, the people-centered culture to a professional with a financial mindset? <laughs> uh, I think uh, uh, the most, I think that uh, everybody has uh, like people-centric culture, uh, even people with the financial mindset. And currently, I think one of my best partners, and I, I usually to say like uh, um, partner in crime is actually our finance director. Uh, so it's not he, he has this financial mindset, but he's also very mind, uh, very mindful about people. Uh, so what they want to say, uh, it's about just listening people and understanding what they want, what are their needs, and then thinking how we can address those needs. And in order to, to help our people, we do have uh, surveys throughout the year and uh, at least three times per year. And we use insights from these surveys to understand what our people want. And based on that, we build action plans. And we try, of course, to implement, and then we implement action plans, and then we listen again from our employees, and so on and so on. So this is how you build your uh, employee or people-centric culture in the organization. Excellent. So Tamina from Canada, she is having a three-pronged question. 
she's of the view that uh, you have subscribed to such a wonderful initiatives. Uh, do they really make a difference to the li life of an average employee in the organization? Number one. Number two, do you have a chief diversity officer role in your organizations? Number three, she is very impressed with the, your um, uh, resume and particularly the exposure that you have around the globe. So she wants to understand the kind of the critical challenges that are being faced on the DEI front. Yes. Uh, so uh, the first question was, sorry, I missed, I was like focusing on the last one and then I missed the, the first one. Ah, yes, do they have impact on our employees? Absolutely, I can guarantee that. And it's not because I'm saying that, but it's because we are measuring everything in PMI. So we have something that we call employee net promoting score. Um, uh, this so we uh, employee net promoting score, we are measuring by, just by using one simple question. And the simple question is, would you recommend PMI as an employer to your colleague, to your friend, and so on and so on? And we had the huge increase, particularly here in Pakistan, uh, on that particular particular score uh, from, for example, 2019 to 2020. And we can see clearly the impact of different initiatives by just measuring this particular uh, score. And we also have all different scores that we also measure and we um, uh, see the progress and so on and so on. And again, what I want to say is surveys are very uh, surveys are anonymous, so people can really, really reply to them anonymously. So we are not imposing. For us, the most important thing is to know to know the truth, and then we can work with that. Uh, regarding chief diversity officer, uh, we don't we have it uh, at the PMI global level. Uh, it's uh, Silke Munster, uh, uh, our chief, and the, the reporting line is to CEO of the company. So it means that diversity is extremely important for Philip Morris. Uh, in P Pakistan, we don't have this kind of position like chief diversity officer, but we have uh, IND, inclusion and diversity. In PMI, we call it inclusion and diversity. And this is my uh, colleague, Galina Khan. Uh, she was actually the one uh, that proposed me to come and to talk uh, uh, to this audience. Uh, so we do have uh, um, present taking care of this. And the last one, um, working uh, across different regions, it's extremely rewarding. Uh, the biggest challenge uh, also uh, comes from learning different cultures. So you always need to adjust, you always need to learn. But I tell you, it's extremely rewarding. Uh, I really enjoyed the uh, my time in South Africa was amazing. I really, I, I consider South Africa as my like second country. I also spent some time in Switzerland. I was also enjoying, uh, and uh, now in Pakistan, I also feel very, very well uh, welcomed, and I'm happy to contribute to this community. Brilliant. Now, one last question, probably uh, uh, by Hola Yaruk Yar Malik, who is the dean in one of the university. She says, uh, do you have a process through which an employee uh, can with complete yes. anonymity uh, whistleblow on a senior? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is part of our ethics and compliance, and this is something that we encourage. We talk a lot about this. So anybody in the company can uh, uh, actually raise any concern, uh, raise any question, uh, and uh, uh, really, really anonym anonymously. So we do have. And thank you very much for that question. Perfect. Thank you for all questions. They're really, they were very inspiring. And sorry for taking a little bit more time on that. A great uh, opportunity to interact. Thank you so much, Marilla, and hoping for more engagement in the future. So with this, uh, I would request Frida to move to the next speaker. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, please keep in mind that uh, the discussion is very interesting, the very engaging conversation, dialogue, questions, and comments. Uh, uh, if we have, I think, sufficient time at the end, I would take the lead on the uh, last part of it, which is the fundamentals of the D&I, which is my part of the presentation. But if we run short of time, I would prefer to defer. 
it to some other uh, time frame because I don't want to rush. That's a very critical part. I think for most of the organizations who want to get into the DNI, but they don't know from where to start over there, that presentation could be very helpful. So it depends if we have uh, sufficient time. So Kerry, over to you. Uh, Sajida, please go ahead. And Kerry, please take your time, no rush. Uh, I think whatever time frame that we've allocated to you, please go ahead with it. And Rida, please uh, introduce the speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mirla. We indeed enjoyed the discussion on how um, PMI is working on the work-life integration benefits and flexibility for its employees. So now moving on to the next speaker, as you all know that business leaders don't only judge DEI's strategic contribution because of its emotional activities in the organization, but also by the impact on the business. So to address this important aspect, Kerry Elric, owner and founder of Project Rescuers from Canada will be speaking on translating DEI into business outcomes. Kerry's boutique consulting firm focuses on helping organizations develop an ethical and sustainable approach to diversity, equity, and inclusion. The completion of her master's of social work degree in anti-oppressive practice coupled with her master of business administration provides Gary with the foundation to develop customized diversity, equity, and inclusion approaches grounded in social justice to eclipse desired outcomes for individuals and businesses. She has been an imperative part in developing a groundbreaking mentor model for women called Circle Mentoring, whereby a mentee is mentored through a group process by three to five women. This approach differs from traditional mentor models as it is not necessarily internal, but rather the mentors are women from a variety of backgrounds and as such provide diverse perspectives on a variety of topics or issues to the mentee. Gary also developed and delivered an online comprehensive assessment tool for leaders to assess their DEI approach against evidence-based best practices. So over to you, Gary. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me and inviting me uh, to this wonderful session. I'm really uh, pleased to be here and uh, really excited to hear um, all of these different perspectives um, around um, all these dimensions um, around uh, DEI and what that looks like in um, different organizations. So thank you so much. Uh, yes, I am coming to you today from Vancouver, uh, British Columbia, Canada. And um, I don't know if uh, uh, many of you have uh, traveled to Canada uh, in, in, uh, in your time, um, but that's where I am today. And uh, I have not yet been to Pakistan, but I'm hoping uh, maybe through some of these connections uh, today that there might uh, become an opportunity for me to be able to travel uh, at one point in time over um, uh, to Pakistan. So again, thank you so much. Uh, so, uh, and thank you, uh, Saida, for the um, wonderful introduction. Uh, so my topic today is talking about turning diversity, equity, and inclusion into business outcomes. Um, the reason that I'm focusing on this is because um, I think that there is often um, an um, initial interest in organizations in um, acting on a DEI um, action or approach to, to make the workforce more diverse, to develop an opportunity uh, for inclusion through equity. But sometimes I think that the um, piece that's missing is that um, there isn't a connection there between the DEI approach and the business outcomes and talk a little bit about about that today why that is and uh, what to do about that so uh next slide please thanks so one of the things that i want to uh just raise right away is that uh diversity is more than what you can see so the reason that i have this is uh my opening um remark or slide is because a, um uh, about a year ago, or a little bit longer, um, right um, as a result of 
the events that occurred in uh, North America, in the United States, uh, around the, um, the murder of George Floyd, um, and the efforts of the Black Lives Matter movement, the grassroots organization who'd already been involved around addressing systemic racism, rose up uh, and, and developed into um, a, a social, um, social change movement very visibly um, and calling out uh, systemic racism. And uh, there was a groundswell of people that were uh, calling out uh, organizations around systemic racism, um, in particular around the police force, um, um, where uh, an incident in which George Floyd, um, a man was uh, murdered by the police, I'm sure you, you may have heard about this event. And um, as a result of all of this, um, these activities coming together, there became a very big um, uh, push and uh, a call out for um, organizations to address uh, systemic racism. And organizations um, across North America, many, many, many started to develop um, a role called um, a diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, something, a, a manager or a, a some, some other kind of title uh, that, that came out of that. So one of the things that I noticed was that uh, in the job descriptions, they were calling for uh, people with uh, lived experience and a they were using um, an acronym called a called BIPOC B-I-P-O-C and that stands for Black Indigenous Person of Color and those were um, the people in particular that they were inviting to apply for these positions. So, uh, next slide please. So the issue around that isn't so much that they were inviting um, people with these characteristics uh, um, and who identified uh, in this manner to apply for these jobs. But what I started to notice was that there was not a connection between uh, the people who would identify as somebody as a so-called BIPOC, uh, but there was no connection between what that what that person uh, would be bringing to the organization. So I started to really uh, think back um, and, and look at that issue and and understood that there was kind of a divergence around what was happening in this area around diversity, equity, inclusion, um, in this kind of movement and in this hiring uh, was that there was organizations that were hiring um, based on what they could see. They were looking, as I said, primarily at um, how people identified, but mostly at, um, at skin color um, and putting people and hiring people into these uh, positions, but not actually thinking about uh, what that person might be bringing uh, to the organization. So this uh, kind of reaction, uh, I think was uh, certainly leaning in the direction more around uh, tokenism um, and perhaps um, uh, uh, reinforcing um, racism to some extent in the organization because there was not a connection between um, what the uh, what the diversity um, aspect um, that the person perhaps was bringing from what they could see how was that going to be uh, connecting to inclusion and equity so what I started to think a little bit about was how to bring awareness to hiring managers, uh, to job posters around um, the need to connect DEI to the business outcomes, to recognize that what you can see uh, isn't all that it, diversity is about. Uh, and also that to uh, recognize that uh, as people, the people who would um, perhaps identify um, into a, a category uh, around diversity, 
uh, also are bringing particular um, experiences. There, there's in particular there's the the lived experiences part of uh, of what these um, what the job posting is about. And so it's really um, important for uh, leaders and for uh, the other parts of the business to be able to uh, recognize that and to to leverage diversity um, in, in their organization to meet the, the business outcomes. So I situate this topic uh, in the uh, Center for Global Inclusion uh, benchmarking tool in uh, category five, uh, advancement and retention. Next slide, please. So I think for example, um, this is a, a common uh, type of um, uh, goal that a, a company might have. They might just have their business goal that they're going to increase their market share by 2% over the next two quarters. And at the same time, in parallel, they also have a DEI goal. We're going to increase the number of women on the upper management team. So next slide, please. But they have not really connected these two, uh, these two initiatives. So go ahead. So turning DEI into business outcomes. So one way to move away from uh, the tokenism, um, potential racism, um, and reductivism by hiring somebody because of, of how they look uh, is to really um, understand what it is that the business outcomes um, you're, you're focusing on and how bringing somebody into the organization or promoting somebody, a woman in the organization into upper management, what skills uh, are she bringing? What knowledge is she bringing? Uh, how is her, her lived experience uh, going to uh, be um, something that is going to contribute to uh, moving forward with, with the business outcomes. So that's the first part, I think, is really thinking through. Um, when you think about um, diversity, that includes um, certainly uh, lived experiences, um, you know, places that people have lived, different jobs that they've had, uh, of course, their training, uh, how they, um, how they, uh, perceive uh, problems and issues and how they like to work. And so the idea around um, the diversity, equity, inclusion um, is one of the, um, uh, using the opportunity of uh, diversity at, as a competitive advantage in the organization of uh, looking deeply and more intentionally at the, at people and what they're bringing, like I just described, into the organization as part of the strategy. So um, how are we gonna work? Uh, what do we wanna be doing differently? How, um, how are we going to innovate on some of the products that we already have? Where do we wanna move to in the market? And how are these um, people who are, are, are different and different co combination or different grouping of people gonna be able to help us uh, figure this out? So I think that's the first part is to really think about what is the strategy? Why, why are we so interested in, in bringing um, on board? Why is it that we wanna move women into decision-making roles? How is, is that perspective uh, going to help us um, move forward? So I think there's the intentionality around that that's really important and an important part of the strategic plan. So the next part is to lay the foundation for this, uh, which goes back to uh, perhaps the, the job postings um, and looking for um, um, a variety of ways of thinking is really what, uh, what, what diversity is about. So I think including that kind of language uh, into the job description uh, is uh, something that um, is more explicit and, 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 and speaks 
better to what the purpose is of diversity uh, and how um, equity and inclusion follow uh, as a result of diversity. Um, so I think that attracting people uh, from um, the perspective of uh, that we're in our organization looking for different ways of thinking, other ways to add to, uh, to what we already know. And um, so these are some of the, um, the characteristics and the qualities that we're looking for. And we also want um, people who are able to and interested in engaging in our, in our strategy and helping us meet our business outcomes. So in particular, there might be some um, um, lived experiences, there might be uh, different places that people have lived or other ways to capture diversity uh, just beyond um, what, what one can, can see. So really thinking about what is the foundation for change, what as a, as a leader or um, um, business um, uh, planning activity, what is it that we really want to, uh, why, how are we going to leverage diversity? So really doing the planning piece. And then understanding um, the business case for developing uh, the diversity equity, and inclusion approach. So um, the other thing that I think I've seen is a lot of um, kind of the tokenism piece is that, you know, we're going to hire, uh, we're going to promote two women in, into uh, management or into, uh, into a, a higher decision-making role and we're going to do X, Y, and Z. Uh, and now we're, we're thinking that we're, we're doing a lot of DEI work. Um, but there's a bit more to that. Uh, to to what to to DEI to in order to move away from from just tokenism from just bringing people in who uh, who might look different than what your uh, kind of status quo um, grouping looks like in the organization. So again, going back to understanding the business case for developing a DEI approach, bringing people in understanding what uh how different ways of thinking and being uh and knowing uh can is really a competitive advantage how that contributes to innovation uh problem solving um connecting with uh a, a, a larger uh client base um and just a a, a much more uh, a broader, robust um, work uh, workforce can enable uh, new thinking and new ways of, of approaching existing um, uh, problems or issues or plans, and help to move uh, the organization uh, to the next to the next level uh, around that. So, really, I think thinking it out uh, quite thoroughly around uh, what's in it for us. Why are we going to engage in, in um, a diversity, equity, and inclusion approach? And how are we going to tie this back again to our business outcomes? Uh, what do we want people in our organization to be doing? Um, and then defining um, what uh, the diversity brings uh, to the, the business development piece. So again, for example, promoting women into upper management will really thinking about what is that gonna to bring to our business development uh, part. So is it is it, it's not only perhaps because the person is, is a woman, but is it because there's a, a particular um, aspect um, of that person that you um, think would, would be um, contributing to the development of um, an aspect of, of the development? Is it something about her training perhaps in uh, people management? Is it something perhaps in her knowledge of finance that you um, are uh, uh, especially interested in and, can, and really can leverage and, and use in the organization? So again, taking that deeper dive around why, why are we wanting to bring women into for management, um, we are going to, to bring in um, uh, two, but but why are we going to limit ourselves to two? When you know, what is it that that um, is uh, um, the incentive for us behind bringing women into upper management? And I think it's, it's a chance then to uh, take that thinking and and to really build that. Uh, into again the business case and looking at what are our business outcomes and who who are the people that we need to bring on board 
uh, and work with to be able to create uh, this, this team and this approach uh, that is um, diverse and um, would bring some um, contribute to the thinking and the planning around that. So these steps uh, all are lead up to developing an approach that moves beyond just performative DEI. And uh, I started off in my talk um, mentioning that um, I noticed about, oh, about, at least about a year ago, 12, 14 months ago, how these job uh, postings were coming up, looking for roles, uh, looking for, as I called, uh, why they, they're identified as, uh, as BIPOC, uh, people with lived experiences. And I think that there's a tendency to hire uh, a sort of a reaction to these, um, to these um, um, events that have occurred. Um, and to the calling out uh, for organizations to uh, take some accountability around addressing systemic racism. And as a result, um, organizations often are doing so, but um, hiring people without really thinking about uh, what's behind people. What are people bringing uh, to the organization um, within their diversity, equity, and inclusion approach? And as a result, um, not uh, not kind of missing the opportunity that that DEI brings to an organization, which are all the things that I just discussed, um, with different ways of thinking, um, being um, contributing to um, uh, different uh, ways to create competitive advantage uh, with high performing teams, um, the knowledge that people bring themselves. Um, to the organization through their uh, various means, their previous jobs, their education, their places that they lived and what they know. So um, really uh, the emphasis I think um, for me is to, uh, for organizations to really think about how they're going to connect uh, their diversity, equity and inclusion approach, the people that they're going to hire into as a result of this um, approach that they're developing, uh, but how they're, they're going to move away from a tick box or from a reactive approach and really connect and, and recognize the value of diversity and the value of moving uh, in my, uh, for my example, you know, women into leadership positions, how, what, what characteristics are they looking for and skills and abilities and um, how are they going to leverage that um, a DEI approach into uh, meeting their business outcomes. Next slide, please. So turning DEI into uh, sustainable business outcomes requires a couple of steps. So there needs to be a willingness uh, for change from the status quo. So leaders have to uh, be prepared uh, for different ways of thinking and being. Uh, that's how uh, organizations move away from um, more of the tokenism is to bring people in and say that, you know, this is the way we do things. And this is the way we're going to continue to do things. Well, that's kind of missing the opportunity of bringing in um, and, and raising up um, different uh, voices, different ways of thinking, um, and changing the culture. So there needs to be a willingness to change uh, from the status quo. Um, and secondly, the understanding the business case for developing a DEI approach. Why are we going to embark on this? Why is it important for us to, um, to, to put out this job posting where we're asking for people uh, with lived experiences uh, to come into our organization? What are we going to do with that? So being mindful and intentional about that is an is a important step for leaders to do prior to putting out the posting. And then to find the diversity dimensions necessary to achieve the business outcome. So I alluded to some of those. So the diversity is more than what you can see, uh, again. So uh, what is it that you really think will be helpful in the organization? What kind of depth and uh, breadth of knowledge um, do you want um, people to bring to the organization that are gonna contribute to um, understanding uh, your market, understanding um, a strategy, how to reach your customers, how to deliver um, and move um, into a, a, the place that you're uh, 
trying to land at in the market. So is it there? Is it knowledge? Is it again the contributions of different experiences? Is it um, uh, different kinds of education uh, that are going to help you uh, in the organization be able to achieve that goal? So thinking about um, diversity uh, as more than just um, something that you can see, but taking that deeper dive and thinking about uh, and being open to exploring different ways um, and understanding different ways of being that are diverse as well. And then develop an approach that moves beyond performative DEI. So um, this again is really important. So at the end of the day, I think a lot of organizations that have hired X, Y, and Z and pop people into the existing positions and feel that they have accomplished uh, a DEI approach because people look different uh, maybe than they did uh, prior. They have uh, on, uh, it looks on the surface that they have a number of different um, people working there, but in fact, they have not tapped into or leveraged uh, what people are actually bringing uh, to, to the organization. They're just um, carrying out the, the functions that, that people um, from uh, in, in any background can do, but they're missing the opportunity to, uh, to, to use DEI to, to be able to see the uh, different ways of thinking and being as an opportunity from them to be able to build their business outcomes. Next slide, please. So I think the key takeaway um, are these. So adding women through a quota system um, to upper management um, is not really enough to leverage the benefits of diversity. Um, having a goal to say we're going to um, promote four women, three women, two women, ten women, it's not. Uh, it, it, it doesn't mean that the organization is going to gain any benefit necessarily from that. So the benefit of diversity is realized when a thoughtful uh, DI strategy identifies the dimensions along which diversity can contribute to the achievement. So again, um, thinking mindfully, why are we going to uh, promote women? What in particular are we expecting uh, or hoping for? And how are we going to figure this out? Is it because we want to think about things differently? Is it because uh, we really liked uh, the work of, of somebody in the organization already and we think that the way that she thinks, uh, the way that she does her work will actually um, bring some benefit um, to others in our organization. So we think that, that moving uh, her to this role will um, help um, our organization grow and be able to um, accomplish uh, the outcomes that we have or the goals that we've set for ourselves for this year. Next slide, please. So that's uh, my presentation for today. So please connect with me. Uh, this is a, a big topic. I'd love to have a conversation with anybody uh, who uh, is interested in going into a, a bit more detail uh, around this and, and some of your questions and comments around that. So thank you very much. Super. Once again, uh... Kerry, thank you so much uh, for the wonderful presentation. Again, the house is open for any questions or comments. Okay, uh, Kerry, I have a question. In your experience, uh, uh, while struggling with the you know motivation for the D and I. Obviously, there are two sides of it. One is the business aspect, and the other one is the social aspect. In your experience, uh, where is the more focus of the organization, which is the primary motivator for the organization to get into the DI? Well, I think that a lot of it seems to be reactive uh, to the social movements that have gone uh, gone gone on, calling out systemic racism, rightly so. Um, and um, really thinking about uh, you know uh, the, um, the the call for action from the community has been for organizations to address systemic racism. So that I think is was the primary driver for what we've seen here in North America as a massive uh, um, movement around hiring people called you know DEI um, in, in the DEI realm. 
Um, so I think that um, it's it's mostly been from the social side that uh, organizations are hiring folks without really um, understanding or taking um, a deeper look, like I said, around what the um, what what that really is about hiring people uh, because they they look different than than what they had normally been hiring um, on the surface sort of side um, without really linking that at all to uh, to what the opportunities are uh, that person might be bringing to the organization. Excellent. Okay, so I think. Uh... Except for Jamal Nasser, I believe rest of the speakers are still available. If anyone has any uh, question uh, still left out, uh, please uh, feel free to express yourself. Why are you doing something? Excellent. So I think it's a comment, uh, not a question. Okay, so with this, uh, uh, as I said, the, that last part of presentation is uh, pertain to uh, my topic, and I would just like to display the topic. Uh, as I said, I think we do not have sufficient time now because I don't want to give it a cursory treatment. So we would look forward to give you some lead time um, uh, for some engagement uh, ahead where I would like to share with you the gist of ex uh, my experience of uh, looking at the almost 40 plus organizations, how they execute the DNI and uh, what are the possible ways of uh, making sure that all the important connections aspects of the DNI, including the business case, leadership commitment, need assessment, infrastructure, system changes, training, measurement evaluation, and evolution, it takes place successfully. I would also like to uh, engage more people in the conversation. So it's a, so it's a two way of uh, learning from each other experience. So. Uh, uh, I think we look forward to, for some future opportunity and not today because we don't have sufficient time and I don't want to take your tolerance test because you already put in your almost 2.5 hours. Uh, obviously, the discussion was quite engaging, uh, very helpful, very useful in terms of learning. So we didn't realize how quickly the time passed. So with this, we would like to conclude. Uh, uh, we would like to send you the recording of today, today's session. Um, uh, you would, uh, in another two days, you would find an email uh, by our team, uh, which would uh, contain a link 